All right, guys, can you hear me now? I think you probably can. Um, and so perfect for a technology live stream, right? I've literally never had this problem on any live stream. Um, but I just switched to my other microphone. I'm actually not getting signal from the microphone that I'm using for some reason. Um, but you should be able to hear me now. I'll wait for you guys to confirm. Hopefully the volume is okay. I'm just now using the built-in microphone on the computer rather than the external one, which is something we're going to talk about on this stream. Um, so hopefully this is all good now. And thank you for your patience. I'm going to say all that stuff again. Um, so I could have taken the stream down and started all over again, but I want to just keep this link live for the people who are following this link. So thank you guys for your patience. Here I am. Oh, echo now, huh? <laughs> this is too perfect for uh, a day like this where I'm gonna be talking all about my expertise uh, to have technological difficulties. But that is a big part of doing this, by the way, and something to be prepared for. Because um, technology, just like our instruments, but I think a little worse than our instruments, we can only rely on it so much. There are always gonna be things that we have to roll with in the moment or problem solve in the moment, like I just did. Um, it's coming through twice now. All right, hopefully this should fix it. Um, so I'll wait for you guys to confirm that this is better, what I can actually do. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I have an external microphone set up. It's actually good that I'm now not using it because now I can show it to you guys instead. Um, but hopefully this isn't too quiet. I'm now just using the built-in microphone on the laptop, which is a good option for those who don't have external microphones, by the way. And we're going to talk all about setups so I can explain even what's going on over here. Um, so again, thank you guys for your patience. Let's get into it now, um, though I will be monitoring if anything else goes weird with the sound. So um, a little bit about me for anybody who is new to the channel or not super familiar with my work. Um, I started posting videos on YouTube all the way back in 2006. I was not doing it with any regularity, but I did have a couple videos of myself playing and I was just kind of casually putting them up on YouTube for fun um, because I wanted to just share that with people. Um, so that was not any kind of regular thing, but I was using YouTube, getting used to hashtagging, searching, having strangers watching my videos, which is a big part of getting used to YouTube. And then when social media really started to boom, um, this for me was like 2012, 2013, when Instagram came out, I really took to Instagram. I'm someone who always liked taking photos. So I really enjoyed Instagram. I was using it just as a personal user. And then around 2014, 2015, I moved it over to be just like a music focused account. Um, and then I did really well on Instagram. I now have about 26, 27,000 followers, all organic. I didn't do any sort of scammy things like follow, unfollow, or buy followers. There's a lot of crap out there these days, unfortunately, to fake your follower count or to kind of deceive about your follower count. I never did any of that just because I'm a very, I'm very big on integrity and it just wasn't satisfying for me to try to fake a following. So all the numbers that I have on my YouTube, my Facebook page, my um, Instagram, which is collectively over 30,000 followers, were all organic that I got myself um, just by sharing my playing and sharing my content regularly. Um, so I do feel that I have a lot to share about this since I've been doing it really consistently since about 2014, 2015 is when I was putting things out all the time. I've also launched a Patreon in 2015, which is still active now that I use to help monetize my YouTube videos in addition to the small amount that I make from advertising on my YouTube videos, um, which I'll talk more about Patreon also for those who want to know. Um, oh yeah, thank you for the compliment on my shirt. Got some instrument players on here. Um, so I've been just putting my music out there as much as possible for at least five years, if not longer. Um, and I really built my career around my online content. So I was making money and building my audience all through things I was posting online. When I formed a string quartet, emergence quartet in 2014, 2013, around then, um, I also would put the string quartet on the channel, but mostly it was all my playing that I was recording myself. And it was all Baroque cello and early music, Baroque music focused, because that is what my master's degree is in, early music. Um, it's a little bit of a niche topic. And so I was really excited to bring something 
kind of so obscure to the wild public of YouTube and Instagram. And it's been amazing to see the response from the public and people who don't know anything about historical instruments or even classical music at all take so much interest in what I was doing and even students and young classical musicians just getting started learning about the world of early music and period performance, historical performance. So I've been really able to bring my music and my own take on my music to thousands of people through technology over the last five years. And it's something I've found so rewarding, um, so satisfying. I've been able to help a lot of people. Um, my YouTube channel is now at 12,000 subscribers. And I would say my most popular videos are either the ones of me playing Baroque cello with the manuscript along with it, like something like the Bach cello suites with the Anna Magdalena which is the closest manuscript we have, um, printed alongside. That's one of my most popular videos. I've also done videos about my experience in my degree programs, both my undergraduate and graduate degrees. Um, some of those videos have been very popular. So just sharing my experience as a classical musician, both in and out of school, my tips for being a freelancer, and then of course my Baroque cello music has been the body of my work that I've been sharing online. And I'm very proud to say I've been able to make it a huge part of my career income wise. I think I've actually probably made more, if not the same, but likely more money from all the stuff I've put out online and what that has brought to me than even in-person gigs and concerts just because I've done my online work so consistently. So um, I definitely want to be taking questions about how you guys can kind of do this yourself. Um, but I want to talk just a little bit about some of the bigger concepts because while everybody wants to know about microphones and you know this and that, that is important. But the approach is really what's going to make a difference. We need a big picture view of how this all works. We can't translate the exact same experience from the concert hall to internet. And I think that's where the disconnect happens. Um, people think that putting music online is just like a big compromise compared to a live experience. And of course it's not the same as a live experience, but there are other things that we can bring when we do this online and knowing how many more people we can touch, how much further we can reach. You know, when you have a local concert, all you have are the people who are locally around and in town and available that evening. When you post something online, you can reach the entire world. You can reach every demographic. You can reach someone who maybe doesn't have the capacity to be able to leave their house and go to a concert or someone that's too young to stay out until 10 p.m. to when the concert's over. There's so many more options for our audience members when we're bringing our material online. So that's one of the reasons I think it's so important and such a valuable thing for us to be doing. Um, all right, let me check in with you guys here. Um, <laughs> thank you for the compliments on my little Sharpie drawings. Yes, I'm a very creative person. I mean, beyond just playing the cello, like I'm just always doing creative stuff. So those are my little Sharpie illustrations. And I have a lot of like inspo on my desk um, just because I sit there a lot. Um, and I like to have things that kind of inspire me or just, you know, give me some good energy. I've got some crystals on my desk. I've got this photo of me when I was... 12 or 13. This is in my high school bedroom with my old electric guitar that I sold when I went to college for cello because I thought I'd never play it again. Anyway, little things like that just to kind of keep my workspace nice and positive. Um, so, um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of focus on uh, recording yourself and uh, the actual technical stuff, which again, we'll get into. But I want to talk a little bit about audience building because who, who are we making these videos for? And um, for me personally, you know, we all have a personal network. If you're a professional, for example, or even you're in school for music and you're getting ready to be a professional, you likely have a network of colleagues and friends and people you play with, people who hire you. Um, so you, of course, want to be using your network to your advantage and you want your, you know, Facebook friends, etc. to know about what you're doing and you should be sharing that. But I do caution people around relying on your own personal connections as your fan base. For me personally, it never felt good to over promote myself to my own colleagues and friends, especially because my own colleagues like they have their own stuff going on. And when we get into the monetization aspect of trying to make money off of this stuff, I never thought it made sense to sort of be promoting myself and putting myself out there with trying to get donations and money. 
um, to my own colleagues who are in the same struggling musician, starving artist situation as me. There are lots of people interested in classical music who are not professional classical musicians. And I think those are the people that we should be reaching out to and sharing our music with more so than our own personal network. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with sharing with your own personal network, but that's one of the big things I see a lot when I notice other classical musicians sharing their stuff is they're relying on that network um, which is not necessarily the most reliable um, long-term fan base and also the ones who are going to shell out the money when you need some money for something. Um, and also I realized in my, uh, let's see here, in my frantic, there we go, I got the little banner back on the bottom. As I was talking about donations, I realized my donation banner had gone down during that whole microphone issue. So I think when we start to shift our focus from our audience is no longer our colleagues and um, maybe board members of organizations that we want to hire us, but instead our audience is just people that could enjoy classical music, it shifts a lot of things. And that's why I want to talk about this before getting into some of the more technical stuff. Um, as classical musicians, we have a lot of fear around putting our music out there without... Um, without feeling like it's a, it's an audition, like it wants to be audition perfect, you know, like top of the line, flawless performance and all this stuff, because God forbid someone important hears us play out of tune. The internet and the world at large and the audience at large does not care about that stuff. And they don't even have the ear to recognize um, the things that we are so overtrained to recognize in classical music. And I think that's really important because so many of us get in our own way by being overly perfectionistic about what we share. And now this is, I'm going to speak only to what I've done and what has worked for me. Everyone's approach is going to be different. Everybody has their own standards um, and their own idea of what's appropriate. So you know, defer to yourself at the end of the day, but these are my suggestions of what I feel has been effective. I posted a lot of videos on my channel, plenty of them are still live, some of them I took down eventually, that have moments that are not perfect. And I've been to dozens, dozens, hundreds of live performances and seen great players make mistakes, play out of tune, it happens. And it's like in a live moment, we're somewhat accepting of it, but the idea of a video being permanently up there with something that's not perfect is like unacceptable. And I have just never subscribed to that. My philosophy was always, if it has to be perfect for me to post it, I'm never going to post anything. So I just told myself if I thought it was decent, I thought it was good, I would put it up and see how it did. And if I got a lot of criticism or it was clear people just didn't like the performance, which has never happened, by the way, I've never had a video that had an overwhelmingly negative response. But if I ever got enough negative comments, I could always take something down or take the feedback into consideration. But... I always found that people would still love and connect with the music even if I thought it wasn't perfect. It was still touching people, it was still bringing me subscribers and followers, it was still interesting to people, and I think that it's very important when we transition out of the concert hall for the type of person who goes to a classical music concert, which is a specific type of person, I hate to say, that is not the majority of at least American citizens. People go out to classical music concerts. No, that's a minority. So the internet now, we are now sharing with the majority in a sense, uh, or just a larger pool of people. And they are way less snobby, way less judgmental, way less trained. But that doesn't mean they won't love classical music. So I think it's important to keep that in mind and not get in our own way, not be afraid to put things out there, even if they're not and I don't even mean just the performance being perfect, but also the recording quality. That was a big thing too um, when I started my channel. Like, well, I don't have a venue or a concert hall to record these videos in, so maybe I can post some from a concert that I did, but I can't post videos in my house. That won't look professional. Like, that was a concern of mine when I started this five years ago. And I'm sure it's a concern for people just starting now. But... Take it from my own videos, my channel, my success. It doesn't matter. YouTube is, you know, it's become a little bit more professional, but especially in the early days of YouTube, like it was meant to be a casual place. And we underestimate how hungry people are for great music and great performances and especially great musicians. Like classical musicians by default 
are so trained at their instruments. And that's amazing to people, especially hobbyists or people who are just casual. To see someone play a classical instrument with great skill is an amazing gift to give people, whether or not your performance is perfect. So really keep that in mind that we should not be afraid to put things out there because the quality is not, the expectations are not there for quality the way we expect them to be as trained classical musicians. And I encourage people to try that out and see for themselves and realize that you can put up a video that you recorded on your phone and hundreds and thousands of people can still love it even though it's just recorded right off your phone. So um, I think that's really important to keep in mind. So it's kind of talking about audience building. So I really built my audience on YouTube and Instagram were my two main platforms. Um, so Times have changed a lot since I first built my audience, especially Instagram. Instagram has been bought by Facebook over the last few years. Um, a lot of things have changed with how things get discovered, um, and it's leaning more towards um, asking for money, like you can run an ad on Instagram the way you can run an ad on Facebook. That didn't used to be a thing, um, but anytime a company starts um, making advertising available, they want to push advertising and paid promotion so they make it harder to get organic natural promotion like what I got when I started my Instagram five years ago. I got all organic traffic because they weren't trying to sell ads at that time. So it's unfortunate that the times have changed, you know, for anyone who got on the bandwagon in the last five years on Instagram, they got to enjoy organic growth like I did. It's a little bit harder now, but it's not impossible. And one of the most important things about putting yourself out there online and with content is consistency. It's easy to like have a day where you're really inspired and you maybe record a bunch of videos, or you record a video or something and you do it and you put it up and then maybe it doesn't get the response that you had hoped or doesn't get as many views or as many likes as you wanted and then you get discouraged and you stop. That's a major pitfall of putting yourself out there online. You have to be consistent. Even if it's just one little piece of content per week, sticking with a schedule and following through is very important because especially fans and followers, they want to know that when they come to your page or if they decide to follow or subscribe to you, that they are going to get good content on a regular basis that they enjoy. So if you're too sporadic, like you're never posting or you're posting a bunch at one time, that's going to turn people off. So just being consistent consistent with your output is a huge important part. For me, when I really got my YouTube channel going, I committed to one video a week, which was very ambitious. I had to edit and record and do all of that, practice the repertoire. So that was a lot. I would not recommend starting with one video a week, but having that consistency made a big difference and also allowed me to eventually launch my Patreon because I was so consistent with what I was putting out. Um, so I definitely think setting some sort of goal for yourself of how often you want to post on a particular platform um, is going to go a long way in building your audience. Every platform is different with how you actually get people to find your stuff. And I can get into the nitty gritty, but I'm kind of trying to keep this more big picture. And then if people have more specific questions about specific platforms, I will address those. Um, but it's like I could do a whole thing just on Instagram, just on YouTube. There's so much to go into. So I'm kind of just trying to cover it all in this stream. And then, you know, I'll take questions. And I do also do consulting for someone who feels like they want consistent one-on-one -on -one help getting their stuff going. Um, I'll talk about all my services and everything a bit later. But um, there's a lot of options if you want to really learn all the details of everything. So where was I? Um, so consistent uploading definitely a big one. Um, for Instagram, of course, if you want to be discovered, you have to be using hashtags. Um, for things like Facebook pages and other things like that, and even on Instagram, what goes a long way is getting featured on a larger account or a larger channel. Um, I know for me, when I was, my little Instagram was less than a thousand followers, I got featured on my friend Drew, that viola kid, he's very big on Instagram, he featured my Bach playing on his Instagram account as like a little feature. And that got me a couple hundred followers that bumped me over a thousand followers and then really started my Instagram growth from there. So it was really thanks to Drew sharing my stuff that I got those subscribers. Now a share is not an automatic guarantee and everything has variables involved. So if you get the opportunity to get featured on a big Instagram or Facebook account to drive some traffic to your account, 
that's great. But if your account doesn't look very good, like you don't have a lot of good stuff up there, your thumbnails don't look nice, it looks inconsistent, or people can't tell who you are or what you do, they're not going to follow you. They're going to see your thing on wherever they're seeing it. They're going to go look at your account, and if it looks like a mess, they won't follow you. So you have to be prepared, too, when you get an opportunity to get featured somewhere or your video gets shared by a larger organization. You have to make sure your stuff is in line so that people want to follow you when they go check you out. So that's something to keep in mind. Nothing is like, do this and you get this. There's a lot of factors involved with every single thing that happens, and nothing is 100% predictable, which is why it's so important to be doing this consistently. You never know which thing is going to hit the right algorithm to get boosted and get a bunch of views, get you a lot of followers and stuff like that. You just never know what that's going to be, so all you can do is show up on a regular basis, share what you're doing, and learn from your feedback, learn from your successes. But if something doesn't work out, don't assume it's never going to work out. Keep at it, but do take feedback into account because you can learn a lot about what clicks with your audience. A big example for me early on when I was growing my Instagram, which is my largest platform now, um, and it was actually a tip from my brother. Um, a lot of you probably don't know, but my brother um, runs a music label and he's a music producer himself. Um, and he is in the video game scene, deals with all video game music. So he has his own niche, just like I have my niche of Baroque music. And he's done some great things across social media too. And he's taught me a lot about social media, especially because the video game community of people who play video games are much more tech savvy than classical music people. So there was a lot for me to learn from my brother's experience. And one of the things he suggested to me early on in my Instagram days was that I should be posting more pictures of me and my cello, like a cello selfie, um, as I've called them before. And I remember when he suggested it to me, I'm like a little, not contrarian, but like I, I have my strong opinions about things that I like to do and don't like to do. And I was like, oh, that's so cheesy, just posting cello selfies all day long. Like, ah, I don't know about that. But I decided to give it a try, and I was amazed at the response. And I started to understand what my brother was saying, which is that people like to see you with your instrument. Like, that's a cool thing. A cello is a cool thing. You're a young musician. People like to see that. And once I started posting those cello selfies and seeing the response, I was like, oh, okay, I get this now. People like this. And maybe it felt a little cheesy to me at first, but I can see how it's helping people connect with me as a musician and it has value. And eventually I didn't find it cheesy at all because I started to understand the value of, in posting something like that. Now I'm not advocating that we all act like sellouts and do what we think is going to be popular. That's absolutely not what I'm advocating for because being disingenuous always comes across. I see so many people trying so hard on social media with the most fake, oh, it's just really makes me cringe. <laughs> It doesn't work. It really doesn't. Or if it does, it's not enough to make up for the fact that you're being disingenuous. You should always be yourself and be real. To me, posting a picture of me with my cello, there was nothing fake about that. It just wasn't what I felt inclined to do at the time. So I would keep that all in mind. It's not, you know, you want to keep in mind what will perform well for you and bring people in, but not at the expense of you know, just being totally artificial. Because at the end of the day, social media and putting yourself out there online is about connecting with people and people feeling a connection to you. And the only way they will feel that is if you're being authentic and you're being true to yourself and true to your music, true to your artistry. If you're making major compromises or doing things that just do not actually resonate with you, that will come across. Uh, whether people can articulate that or not, it will come across. So um, social media and internet presence is not about faking it or being something you're not. That's why I so talk about everybody has to find their own way and, and really get in touch with themselves and who they are and how they want to express themselves through their music. These are all things we should have learned in music school, but we're so busy learning repertoire and practicing and trying to be perfect that I think a lot of people actually lose their ability to be in touch with their inner artist, but your inner artist is what's going to get you followers and subscribers. So it's time to prioritize that if that's what your goal is. All right, let me check in with you guys. Um, how long were you doing one video per week um, to feel like my audience was large enough for Patreon? So this was beginning of 2015, so I'm going to do my best to remember this accurately. So I think I actually started doing once a week only about two months before the Patreon, but I had been consistent on the YouTube channel at least one video a month 
um, up until that point, and I had had the channel active for years. So I had gotten subscribers from like some of my old videos. So I had a couple hundred subscribers on my channel already. Um, and then I was doing somewhat regular content, and then I switched to the every week just to ramp up launching the Patreon, actually. Um, so I committed to once a week for, like I said, about two to three months um, with the idea that I was going to launch a Patreon. So I really think Patreon or anything like that, fundraisers, which I do a lot of, of course I have this one today, um, you have to be providing something that is worth something to people before you can expect them to give you money. Um, so the idea of like putting everything behind a paywall, if it's like your own playing or something, I don't really think it works. I think you have to be giving stuff away for free. Like I'm doing this free live stream with all this information right now that I could have done an expensive webinar about, but here I am on YouTube talking about it for free. I think that you have to be building in just you have to be building your audience with free content first before you make it about money. You can of course always accept donations, like I do them on the live streams now, I take donations, but you can't go into it expecting that before you've really built up a following and an audience. So I encourage everybody, do things for free for a while, show people your value. Make them want to pay for what you're offering. Don't make it like, you'll find out how good my content is once you start paying for it. It's like, no, show everybody what you have to offer and, and they will want to pay you for it. Um, so if you have, um, Eduardo asks, he has no social media presence, is starting on YouTube or Instagram the right way? So it just depends what kind of content you want to make. YouTube in general is going to be like more you're going to play the entire movement or something. On Instagram, you can keep it a lot shorter, though they do have the IGTV thing now that allows you to put videos up that are um, even longer than a minute. I think Instagram in some ways is a little easier because it's just simpler and more casual. YouTube is more of like an undertaking. So like you want to be ready to launch a YouTube channel, like have a plan in place for how you're going to record your videos. Um, again, they do not have to be fancy. I will get into that. But like, have some repertoire in mind that you're going to record, whether it's, you know, solo repertoire or if you're gonna get fancy and try to record two parts and dub them together or dub yourself over with another person who sends you their part, whatever you're gonna do. If you're gonna do YouTube, you kind of want to have like a bit of a plan of what you're gonna be filming. Whereas Instagram, you can be a little more casual, like you can just share a little video from your practice session. And if you're practicing every day, you'll always have content. Um, so it's more like, do you want to have a sort of presentable, nice, I recorded this piece, I recorded this piece, I recorded this piece, that's YouTube. If you want to just start getting your playing out there as soon as possible, sharing little short bits of inspiration and that kind of stuff, I would say Instagram. And you can also do both. You, I mean, I would suggest doing both, but um, I think Instagram might be a little bit easier in the beginning. Um, so, but let's talk a little bit uh, about maybe doing YouTube videos. So again, people are always very concerned about like where they're recording. Um, and I've lived in, I moved so many times when I lived on the East Coast, I was practically moving into different apartments every year. So I've recorded YouTube videos in like all my different apartments with various different setups. Um, it always required a little bit because I live in cities and I live in apartments without a lot of space. It always requires a little bit of rearranging of the furniture to frame a good shot, but it's very doable in everyone's home. You know, like if you have to move the couch, it's not a big deal. Like you move it. Um, people don't mind if it's a cozy home environment. Um, YouTube was made for homemade videos and... Instagram and social media is even more so casual. So my only advice for like setting up your environment of the shot is make sure nothing is too distracting, but um, you know, I think a little bit of your life in the shot is not the worst thing. Um, and you can play around with that or, you know, I, I think that trial and error is a big part of putting out content regularly. The only way we can learn what works or what wasn't so great or what was really good is just by doing them and putting them out. So again, it's this idea of consistent content, just doing it, just showing up every day saying, I'm going to make this video that I said I was going to make and putting it out there. Um, so uh, I would say in terms of the shot itself, 
definitely do the best you can with what you have, but it's not a big deal to show a little bit, you know, of your home. Sometimes it even makes it a little more cozy and you can get creative of basically making a little set for yourself to play for videos. So um, it's very doable no matter what your living situation is. As for recording audio, people ask me about microphones all the time and uh, I have used this one simple device for all my videos. I show it on like every live stream and every video. I'll show it again today. It's the thing that didn't work for the audio this morning. Still no idea why. I think that, um, I think the reason that the audio did not work at the beginning of the stream was because I plugged in the microphone after I had booted up my live streaming software. So to do these live streams on YouTube, I use software called OBS. And it's a pretty simple, I mean, live streaming to YouTube is a little bit complicated compared to like a live stream on Instagram or something where you can live stream direct from your phone. But it's not crazy complicated. You just have to have streaming software, which I'm using. Um, and I think I plugged in my audio device after I'd already booted it up so it had not recognized it. And that was the problem. But so for audio, so I guess, hopefully this isn't gonna do anything crazy. I don't think it is because I am now using the internal microphone, so. We're just gonna take this baby out. Um, microphones. So a microphone itself um, does not store any audio. It is just a device that is capturing sound. So that sound that you capture has to get saved or recorded or put somewhere. Usually that's like a computer. Um, so I usually don't advise that people get like nice fancy microphones because then they need what's called an audio interface, something that can plug the microphone into the computer. Or if it's a USB microphone, it can go directly into the computer, but it still needs to go onto a computer into software like GarageBand will be a basic simple one, but any kind of audio software that is then saving the audio that the microphone is recording. So that's a bit much I find for people just getting started, which is why I really like the Zooms. Lots of people have these already, um, but this is what I've had since, I don't even know, college for me. So pre 2010, or maybe it was around 2010. This is the Zoom H4n. And there's a couple things I really like about this. It's not cheap. It's like in the 200 ish dollar area. But like I said, I've had it for over 10 years. It served me really well. I don't plan on replacing it. So it's a worthy investment. But if you're not even in a place where you're ready to spend $200, I'm gonna talk all about how you don't even need any fancy gear. But if you want something that's nice, the Zoom recorders are good for a couple reasons. One, they're a stereo microphone. So you can see that there's two microphones here and that's capturing sound from the whole room. So it sounds really great um, for a solo instrument, but it's also great for live concerts, which I know we're not having right now, but we will eventually, because you can capture like a whole ensemble with this stereo microphone setup. And then it has an audio interface inside of it, which means that it can store the audio that it's recording right in here. It has an SD card like a digital camera has, and it stores the audio. So it's super handy, you don't need anything else. You can put this, I lost the battery thing on the back. <laughs> you can put it on a tripod, you can set it on a table, you can do anything with it, you don't need anything else. And it can record for long periods of time, so a whole concert, or just for the duration of whatever video you're recording. Um, but it's just so handy, and then you can use the SD card to then transfer the files to your computer however you want to, or you can even plug it in and use it as a USB microphone. That's what I normally do on my live streams, and that's what I was supposed to do today, and it got messed up. <laughs> but, um, so it's very handy for that reason, and I do have a link to this one, this exact model that I have in my Amazon shop, which is linked in the description of the video. It has all my basic cello supplies there. So if you're interested in the Zoom, really, really great investment, I think, for classical musicians to have. Um, so it's a microphone and an audio interface in one. I really think it's your best option. So that is in the description below. My Look for my Amazon shop link. Um, so that's what I would say for, and the audio sounds great. I recorded all my solo cello albums and even my duo album with violin was just recorded on this. So it's not the same as a professional studio setup, but that is not necessary for what we're doing. It really isn't. The layman's ear cannot tell the difference. Even some trained ears cannot tell the difference. So don't stress over professional recording quality. It doesn't need to be. Um, there are little things you can do that will make a difference and make it sound good, but it does not need to be 
studio professional quality to be acceptable and enjoyable for people to listen to. So that is my, when people ask me about microphones, this is really my main answer. Um, if you have a relatively new iPhone or probably even some Androids, but definitely iPhones, they have great microphones and cameras. You can really record yourself um, just on your phone and especially for social media, but potentially even for YouTube, you can record on your phone and get an acceptable product. Um, you want to make sure your settings are set, you know, that you're getting the highest quality video that your phone can capture. And then you can treat the audio after the fact um, in a couple of ways. And some of you guys might know that I have an audio mixing tutorial that I put out. It is linked in the description of the video. So, and I highly recommend it if you are trying to get into posting videos of yourself. It's basically a bare bones, just getting started in GarageBand, how to mix your audio. GarageBand is free software for anyone who has an Apple computer. So I thought it was a good thing to do because most people who at least who have Apple computers will have the software. And it's just me showing you how to take a basic audio track that you've recorded on your phone or anywhere and just get it sounding a little bit better using compression, EQ, and reverb, just our basic audio mixing treatment to get things sounding really pretty decent. So I know sometimes we wish we were playing in like a big church or a concert hall so that we have a nice acoustic, but let that go. It's actually okay to have a very dry sounding recording because that's a better signal to then put some artificial reverb on after the fact. And it doesn't sound artificial, especially if you do it um, carefully and you listen to the instructions in my tutorial, you can get a really nice warm sounding reverb from a very dry room. This was something I was experimenting with a lot when I was first doing my YouTube videos, and I would get very mixed reviews. Um, I would put a decent amount of reverb because I just thought it sounded better, honestly. But some people could see I was in a small room and the reverb didn't fit the room that I was in. So sometimes I would get comments of people like, eh, too much reverb. But I would get just as many comments of like, sounds incredible. So just know you can never please everybody. So do what sounds best to your ear, but don't be afraid to treat the audio and make it sound, if you listen to any classical recording, there's plenty of reverb. So just because your video is filmed in your living room doesn't mean you can't make the audio sound somewhat comparable to like what a recording might sound like and recordings of classical music, especially solo instruments, chamber music, all have a good amount of reverb. So um, don't be afraid of it and you don't need to rely on natural acoustic reverb. You can add it in post-production. It's very simple, especially on GarageBand. Um, so definitely check out that tutorial if you wanna learn. It's about 30 minutes long and it's just me walking you through from the very beginning, taking your audio, slapping it into GarageBand, making little cuts if you need to, like if you made mistakes and you wanna patch in a different part in a different section, little things like that, just like your bare bones basic. Um, so that tutorial, it's on my website, emilyplayscello.com slash tutorials, if you just want to go direct there. Um, so yeah, so that's the basic on recording setup. If you don't even have the resources for um, a microphone, again, using your phone and then just doing some basic touch-up in GarageBand on the audio is perfectly acceptable. I was also going to talk a little bit about cameras and just say, so what I film most of my YouTube videos on is this old Canon Rebel T3i. This is from 2009. It was like one of the first digital SLRs that could do a video capability. Um, and it's got this nice flip screen. Uh, I really like this camera, but it's very old. It's from 2009. It's not that fancy. I never got a nice lens for it. It's just a very basic digital SLR, which are nice equipment. Don't get me wrong. Um, most digital SLRs, at least maybe they've updated them these days, but the older ones, they can't capture continuous video for like more than about seven minutes or so because the file size gets too big. At least that's the case on this. So I couldn't use this to record like long concerts or anything like that. I would just use it for like YouTube videos where I would do like a five minute um, movement of something. So this is what I film my YouTube videos on, like the ones that are more formal. Um, but it isn't even necessary to have a digital SLR. Like I said, this one's over 10 years old, so it's not even like it's crazy fancy. And nowadays, iPhone cameras um, and stuff like that are such great quality. What makes a bigger difference is your shot, like your actual framing of your shot and how that looks, and the lighting. Lighting is huge. 
you're almost better off getting yourself like a ring light, which they sell or fluorescent lights that you can use that will give you what sort of um, emulates like natural light as opposed to indoor light, which is going to seem very yellowy um, when you record. I recommend like an LED ring light or something like that. Lots of like beauty bloggers use them. So you'll probably find that kind of information if you go searching for one. Um, but just getting good lighting or even better if you have like a window that gets you a lot of natural light and you are able to film by that window. Lighting makes much big, a bigger difference, I think, in how your shot looks than if your camera is super fancy or not. So um, keeping in mind just the overall visual presentation, it's sort of taking the focus away from what we're so used to focusing on with classical music, which is this must be a perfect performance. Nothing can be out of tune. You know, you can't miss this. The tempo can't be too slow or people will think you're lazy. You know, just like all this classical stuff we think about. Start thinking like a regular person who doesn't know a lot about this music. They're going to look at you. They're going to think, do I like this person? Uh, is this a visually pleasing image that I'm looking at? You know, what's the setting that they're playing in front of. That doesn't mean it has to be a concert hall. It can be your living room. But if your living room looks cozy and welcoming, then that's a nice aesthetic. Is the lighting good? Is this person connected to their music? You know, what does their music sound like? That's what people are thinking about. They're not thinking about all the details we've been overly trained to overthink. So try to get a little out of our classical musician headspace and into the headspace of a regular person. And that will help guide you in making the decisions for your videos and your content. Um, let's see. How do you go about bookings for a U.S. tour? How does your YouTube social media contribute to building your interest in, oh, building interest in your music? So obviously touring and concert dates are not going to be a huge focus of this stream since the whole thing right now is everyone's concerts and tours are canceled due to the crisis of the world right now. Um, but yes, I mean, Building your audience is a very important part of being able to show promoters or, you know, people putting on concerts, I guess the promoters, maybe not the right word in classical music, um, organizations, boards that are putting on concerts, you want to show that, you know, you have people interested in your music. So if you're putting out content regularly and building your followers and subscribers, yes, that only looks better for you when you want to try to get, uh, you know, tour dates, places and stuff like that knowing that you have fans across a broad, you know, not just in your city, but maybe across the whole country or even across the whole world. Um, it's definitely very important for that. But again, I'm trying to not talk too much about live performance today, just because we're going to focus just more on the online um, and the value in that. I mean, I guess I can see how people are maybe trying to build their online presence so that after this crisis, then they feel they have more options. But an online audience is typically just very spread out, so it's not the kind of thing where you're going to get a bunch of fans in Austin and now you know you can add that as a tour date. That's not really, you know, for me and my channel, like, I know I have viewers all across the world. I have someone I met through the internet, I've actually never met him in person, in Australia once told me that a teacher was showing my videos to her class in Australia. I have never been to Australia, um, but there were my videos. Maybe I could tour in Australia eventually, but the point is, it's just more of a sort of spread out thing. It's more about kind of bringing that community together virtually than tapping into it in person as much. Though, of course, having an audience, having a fan base is just a good look for anyone that you try to approach for a professional opportunity. Um... I have never had a personal assistant or a manager or booking agent or anything. I've always done everything myself, completely um, self-made. So, and that's just how I like it. But I never was big on like trying to do big tours. For my career, a lot of the stuff I did was my own independent projects, which feeds in really nicely with online content. So after um, I finished my master's degree, I decided that I wanted to record a solo unaccompanied cello album, which I just recorded myself in my apartment with this guy. I was lucky enough to have my brother who is a mixing and mastering engineer um, help me with the process, but now I'm at the point where I can mix my own audio myself. Um, but then when you record something yourself, it then becomes a product that you can sell online digitally, a digital album, which is a whole separate topic I can talk about is distributing your music online. And again, it doesn't have to be like a studio quality. It's kind of like releasing a live album, sort of in a sense. Like 
it's not quite the quality of a live studio recording with Grammy winning engineers, but that doesn't mean you can't make it sound good and people want to enjoy listening to it. So that's important to keep in mind. We have all these like ways that we kind of put everything in a box. Like we can't do this because it's not this. And I just encourage people to kind of like let that go because we can do a lot. We have a lot, like technology is in a place where we have so many resources right at our fingertips. Like everything I've done in my career, I guess I have had a little bit of assistance, like I mentioned from my brother, but other than that, I've done it all myself. And most people can uh, with a little time and learning and practice and trial and error. So that's really more what I'm trying to preach here is that you can be a totally self made musician by using online and you know technology to your advantage. Um, thank you guys so much for the super chats, by the way. Um, let me just take Randy's question. Um, suggestions for amateur musicians. Is there space? Absolutely. I mean, that's the beautiful part of the internet is that um, people are sharing their music who are like, you know, not necessarily professionals or kids even. I mean, I will say that because amateurs and kids share their stuff online it does help the professionals shine like I found in my experience when I started sharing my playing people were like oh my god you're so good because it's like there were a lot of like kids and just like random people you know people who are hobbyists putting their stuff out there so then a professional comes and it's like oh wow look at this um but that doesn't mean that the amateurs and the kids should stop I think it's great um, again, everything is about like, how are you connecting with people? So like, if you're sharing um, something that's just like, you're, you're sharing a little bit of information about the piece that you're playing or why you're playing it, or the piece of music you decided to play is maybe your favorite from a little something. And maybe it's something from a movie that people know, or maybe it's a popular piece from this or that. There are so many avenues for people to connect with your music that are not just like the quality of your music and if it's professional level or not. Um, and it's also very inspiring for people, I think, to see amateurs thinking like, wow, this person is, you know, an adult, but they're just learning how to play this instrument. Like, maybe I could do that. I always thought, you know, I couldn't play an instrument. I was too old, but look at this guy, he's doing it. So like, I think there's absolutely space for everybody to be putting their music out there. And the more the merrier, really, I don't think it's a competition. There's enough space for everybody on the internet. Um, so I really think that that everyone should be sharing their music if they feel so inclined, especially if you want to be doing it, you should be doing it. Um, okay, so I'm actually, I'm doing so much talking, which is fantastic. I'm going to refill my glass of water and give you guys a couple seconds if any of you want to throw in some more questions and then think about where to go from here. We've already been going for 49 minutes. If you want to subtract five for the silence at the beginning of the video. So I just want to make sure I really hit on everything um, before we wrap up. So be right back, guys. All righty. Um, Um, how come you don't play with an orchestra? You have so much potential to be playing cello concertos even. Thank you so much. Um, so I have done, hmm, when I started focusing on Baroque and early music, that definitely cuts down what's available for orchestral playing already because I was really only interested in playing period instruments um, when I finished my degrees. So basic symphony orchestras and stuff like that were automatically out just because I wasn't interested in playing modern repertoire. You know, I lean way more towards chamber music myself. Um, that's why I formed a string quartet and why I've done a lot of like duos and a lot of unaccompanied music. I personally just like the smaller, more intimate ensembles for myself. Um, play, I enjoyed playing in orchestras when I was younger. That's of course how I got a lot of my string education, you know, like in high school. And then uh, through my undergrad, my four years of undergrad, I was of course playing in the symphony orchestra as part of my degree requirements. So I got to play a lot of great orchestral repertoire and have those experiences. But once I was a professional, I just didn't want to sit in a big cello section and just be one of many. I always kind of wanted to be able to have my own voice and individual expression, which is a little bit harder when you're in an orchestra. Does not mean it's a bad thing. Everybody's different. Some people love being a part of a section. 
So I'm not saying it's any lesser than chamber music, but it just wasn't really the right fit for me. So um, that's why I didn't, up, didn't end up doing a lot of orchestral playing. Um, uh, what would you say is a good amount of consistency once a month? You said once a week was pretty difficult. So it depends what you're doing. Once a week is difficult if you're doing like a polished, edited YouTube video. Um, once a week is a lot, unless you have a lot of time. But if you're just posting clips on Instagram that you're recording from your phone, for example, you should be able to do a couple of those a week, if not one a week. Um, I think for social media, you should be posting at least three times a week. It, doesn't, it can just be a photo. It doesn't have to be a video content. Um, you know, and I encourage like the people that I coach through my social media consulting, like I encourage those people to just like share your world. That's a big part of social media. So like taking a little picture of your music stand with what you're practicing on it, or like I always take a picture of like my cat sleeping next to my cello, like just let people into your world. Like remember that social media is about connecting with people. It's not about selling yourself. It's about connecting. And the way we connect is we share who we are, because if we don't share who we are, what are people even connecting with? So letting people into your world, even with just a photo of something musically related, is a great way to be putting out content that isn't, you know, difficult to do. Um, so, but I would say if you're making like more polished videos that require editing, that um, once a month is good for like a video that you made. But like casual stuff, I think you should be able to do a few times a week or once a week minimum. Um, for posting and stuff though, like at least actual posts on Instagram, I would never post more than once a day on your feed. That's what your Instagram story is for, but don't post a bunch on your feed. Like posting three things in one day, it's just like nobody wants that. Um, so you can overdo it, that's definitely true. Um, um, let's see. Sorry guys, just trying to keep up with everything. Thank you for the questions though, I really do appreciate them. Um, would you be up for talking about creating edited videos with two or more musicians? Tips for uh, taking and editing the tracks. Yeah, so um, putting together videos, and I, okay, I see a lot of stuff coming in guys and I just, I want you to know I'm gonna get to all of it. Or I'm gonna get to all the ones that I think are important and relevant for the stream. So you can keep the questions coming, it's just gonna take me a little while to get through them all. Um, so patching together a recording with multiple players is definitely something more people are doing now and it's awesome and I encourage it. It's so cool that we can do like virtual chamber music. So um, it's a different workflow depending on how everything is recorded and how you go about recording it to begin with. Most people don't like to use a click track for classical music, which I understand and I do not use one either. Usually what I do, because of what most of what I record is Baroque music, which is, you know, the foundation of Baroque music is the basso continuo bass line. I will usually record the continuo part first, but it just depends. Um, sometimes I'll record the solo part and then it's easier to fit the continuo in. I think it depends on the piece and the parts, but you want to decide who is going to record first and then everybody, you know, records to the other person's playing and that's kind of how you make sure the recordings themselves will be in sync. And if everybody does an okay job with the performance, there should not be too much to fix because everybody's playing along by ear to a part that's already recorded. So the timing should still be okay. Basic edits with timing and stuff like that are all in my GarageBand tutorial that I mentioned earlier. So if you're just looking to like see how to edit things, definitely check out GarageBand, my GarageBand tutorial. Um, again, link in the description or emilyplayscello.com slash tutorials. But, um, yeah, and then for the syncing up video and audio, it depends what software you're using. Um, but usually just as musicians, our eyes and our ears are very trained. So it's more like just learning the software of how to put everything together and setting up a workflow of who records first, then who records after that, and then that person records to those two people and so on, so that there's kind of everybody's sort of kept on the same grid. Ho hopefully that answered the question. Um... Uh, what kind of editing do I do with my videos? So some of the videos on my channel, when I was getting more fancy and doing a lot of YouTube videos, sometimes what I would do, because I do have more than one camera, I have this one that I showed here that I use for most of my videos, and then I do have 
like a more camcorder style video camera that I used for like recording long concerts and stuff. This guy, just cause it can record for like two hours without powering down or breaking the file. So like I have this, even though the lens isn't as good for longer performances. So there were a few videos where I would record video out of this from one angle and video out of my other camera from another angle. And the only, it's very simple to do because when you're filming the video, you just turn both cameras on so they're both filming at the same time. And then when you go to put the audio in, uh, if you do that separately, or you can just keep the audio from just one of the video clips if you're just recording the audio straight through the camera, um, which you'll have to see if you like the way your camera's microphone sounds. I know for me on this digital SLR, I do not like the microphone that's in this camera. So I would always record on my Zoom and then just sync up the audio. And syncing up, it just, it's as simple as getting used to looking at a waveform and understanding what that is and just dragging it to the right spot and using your ears and your eyes. It's not hard. Again, I'm not doing like software tutorials on this stream. Um, it's something that we can work on if you want to get consulting with me or something that you can honestly look up on YouTube based on the software you're using. But so if you just film two videos at once from two different angles, when you do your takes, you can just go in with the two videos, the two video clips, and then you can just in different sections switch to a different video clip. So basically you don't record the sections um, like I'm going to record the A section on this camera and the B section on this camera. You record the entirety of everything on both cameras and then you can decide when you want to switch the video from one shot to another basically. Um, uh, oh hey Eske, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a while. Happy you could come in. Let's see. You mentioned that. Uh, okay, general audience versus your local musical community. Also, guys, sorry. I know I look crazy when I read. My eyes get like really crazy looking. So sorry. Um, how do you separate it? I get the most harsh critics from my colleagues. Yeah, so that's the problem, is that our colleagues are so, everybody's so mean and so critical and so judgy. Oh, it's horrible, honestly. I, that's why I really focused all my efforts on just getting my own audience that had nothing to do with my colleagues and my own musical scene, because I just felt like people have a lot of their own insecurities and anxieties around video recording and so much of it is projections like they see someone post a video that's maybe not perfectly in tune and they think about how they would feel if they did that and like they project that onto you and or worse they don't have this is the biggest thing is people don't have the courage to do it themselves like put themselves out there and put their playing on the internet so when they see someone else having the courage to do that, it makes them feel inadequate and then they tear you down to make themselves feel better. Very common thing. So I have just tried to just not care what my colleagues think. I know that's not the easiest. Um, all I'll say is that people slowly start getting more respectful as you build your audience and as your numbers start to show, you kind of prove it to people like, hey, what I'm doing is valuable. So it's kind of like you have to just not worry about the criti the criticism that comes from your own colleagues because those are not the people you're trying to impress. Like I said, our own colleagues, they're starving artists like us. They don't have a lot of money and support that they can give because unfortunately, like as musicians, a lot of us are struggling or just not in a place of real abundance. But there are lots of people who love classical music who are, you know, doing real jobs like scientists and doctors and lawyers and like they have they have money that they can spend supporting musicians that they think bring something valuable to the world. I would rather focus on those people or like kids who want to be classical musicians who have parents who have regular jobs who have expendable income. Um, you know I just think that we can't let the criticism of our colleagues get in the way of us connecting with the people who can truly truly support us. That's just been my personal philosophy. Like I've said, everyone's different. Some people really want to be in with all their colleagues and have everybody approve of them so that they always get hired for certain gigs. And I'm not trying to tell people to not do that if that works for them. But for me, it was like, I would rather just focus on building the audience that I want to have of genuine fans who like me and like my music and like my playing rather than 
worrying about my colleagues judging me even though their judgments are mostly coming from their own insecurities anyway. So I don't know if that was helpful or not. Um, just finishing up my historical performance degree at Peabody on Viola de Gamba. I love Peabody. Um, where do you think HP is going in 10 years time? Interesting question. I mean, even in the last five years, it's really grown, which is so great. I mean, I know Juilliard was a big part of that by launching their historical performance program. I guess that was like more than five years ago now. Um, I think the biggest thing is that it's just becoming more a regular part of classical music education, whereas before it was like this weird off to the side thing that even classical musicians themselves were kind of anti historical performance because like, what you're saying I can't play with an end pin what you're saying I can't use vibrato it's like classical musicians were against their own like their own history. But that's changing, thankfully, um, since so many more people are playing early music. So I think what we're going to see is it's just going to become more a part of classical music in a way so it's not as stigmatized. It's already happening, and I think it's just going to continue to happen. Also, I think it's going to become more a part of the educational circuit of classical music. I know I used to do a lot of demos. I mean, I still have it, um, in Los Angeles, but I did a lot more on the East Coast of demos to schools showing my Baroque cello and playing it and explaining the differences. I think it's such an amazing way to make classical music actually more of like a history lesson because when we come in and play classical music and say like, oh, Mozart, you know, wrote this at this time and then we play it on these like steel strings modern instruments, there's actually like a disconnect. I find bringing classical music into a classroom and actually playing on more historically appropriate setup instruments and talking about the gut strings, talking about the different construction, it makes the history part a lot richer, which I actually think improves the connection to the music. Um, because we can't act like classical music is, it's not part of popular culture really, and that's okay. We, we should honor it as history, which is what it is. We're never gonna stop teaching history. We shouldn't stop studying historical music, but we should study it within the whole context of the history, which is what historical performance is all about. So I actually hope that historical performance will keep classical music alive because it actually brings in more elements of actual history rather than just, here's the music, it's the best music in the world, you better like it, which is like kind of feel like the old school classical music approach. Um, uh, I've learned to play music by ear, still learning the cello by ear, and I'd like to read music. Um, so not super relevant to social media, but, um, hmm, reading music, honestly, like, for cello and string instruments, private teachers are pretty much the main way that you want to learn, um, and I know people do online teaching for right now when nobody is really going anywhere. Um, so I couldn't tell you off the bat any online resources for learning to read music specifically for cello. I do use the Suzuki cello books for my beginner students. It's definitely the best like early building method, but if you can't read music yet, it won't get you very far. Um, so I would consider maybe learning to read music on a very basic level, bass clef notes before you even bring it into cello if you're already learning by ear and then sort of work on patching those two together after you've kind of gotten used to reading notes on the staff, then bring your ear playing into reading the notes as well. Um, okay. So, okay, some of these questions are not super relevant to the online technology stuff that we're trying to focus on here, so I'm not gonna take those questions. Thank you guys for understanding, uh, but I just wanna keep this all on the techie internet stuff because that's what this is about. So um, we went over gear. If you're just tuning in late, thank you for joining. I hope you watch the archive once this is over um, and you'll catch everything that you missed. Um, but I was going to also talk a little bit about my Patreon that I use um, to monetize because a lot of people want to know like, okay, so how can you actually make money? Like, yes, you can build an online, you know, presence, but what does that really mean? you know, if you get all your gigs in person. Um, but monetizing and making money online is of course a big topic that people wanna know about. So for me, I do make money off of my YouTube channel through ad revenue, um, but it's not very much. And I think for classical musicians, that's not a great goal just because 
classical music is still niche in terms of like the world at large. So it's hard to get hundreds of thousands of views on videos because there just aren't that many people searching for them. You know, a lot of people who like classical music, of course, still go to concerts live. Um, so, but if you do want to get a lot of views on your videos and that's really your goal, um, performing and recording popular pieces, especially popular student pieces, is a great way to go about that because there are lots of kids who after their violin lesson, they go search up their piece. Um, and then there are people who are, you know, hear a famous piece in like a TV show or something and find out what it is and they search it. So doing popular repertoire is definitely a good way to get views, but it's very hard to get enough views to make enough money to feel like you're making money off of YouTube. So that's why I use Patreon, which is basically a platform where you can pledge a certain amount, um, per month or for me it's per video that I post. And every time I post a video, um, my patron gives me that amount. So some people pledge just a dollar. And every time I post a video to my YouTube channel, I charge them a dollar. So it's their way of kind of giving me a little tip and helping support my endeavor. It's not necessarily a large amount, but once you start to have multiple people giving you a dollar, three dollars, or five dollars a video, it adds up. And the most important thing for doing something like that, as I talked a little bit about earlier, is you want to be providing valuable free content first. Before you start trying to get people's money, you should be putting stuff out there that is truly of value before you are asking for money for it, just to show people that you have value to give and that money is not a requirement. It makes people more likely to want to support you knowing that they can already see what they're going to get when they support you. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind if you're curious about Patreon. And again, Patreon is something where just like all social media, you have to be consistent. You have to be doing it on a regular basis. People want to know what to expect from you. So it can't be totally all over the place. If you're new to putting out content, you should make a little schedule or make some goals, make a little outline, whatever you got to do to get yourself organized. Um, because consistency really is key. I know I've said that a lot, um, but it is. Um, so what else? Um, we talked about audience building and who the audience is, reframing our mindset to no longer be trying to play for our colleagues or board members of organizations, but instead trying to play for the general public and try to put ourselves in their shoes and what their experience would be as a listener. That's huge. Um, presentation is important. Like I mentioned, good lighting and a nice setting. Um, but it doesn't have to be formal to be good. Um, talked a little bit about, we talked about our technical stuff. Yeah, so I feel like we did cover a lot of good stuff. Um, trying to think if I had anything specific, but I think I said pretty much all of it. So I'm going to take a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. So definitely get in your final questions. I guess I'll use this time to say um, I'm doing these live streams every week now. I decided to commit to a weekly live stream, at least during this time of quarantine, lockdown, everybody staying home. I thought it was a good time to be bringing weekly content back to my YouTube channel. I used to put out videos every week that I recorded and edited and produced myself. Um, I've slowed down on that a lot. I don't need to get into it a ton, but I have other musical endeavors that are non-classical that I'm spending a lot of time with now that have become more my priority, but it's very important to me that I always keep this channel up and running and as a safe haven for classical and Baroque music. There needs to be more places like my channel, in my opinion, so I'm never gonna like move my whole channel over to my other music project or stop doing this altogether. I've committed to still showing up and providing information and education, sharing my repertoire. I'm always going to do that, um, but I'm just not doing it with the same frequency that I used to and that I was doing when I really built this following. So it's important to keep in mind, I got all my followers and built up my 30,000 people when I was on it consistently making it my priority. Now it's, I, I'm keep, I'm doing the upkeep to keep my channel and my followers, um, you know, satisfied with content, but I'm not in the growth period that I was, you know, the last five years. So that's also just something to keep in mind. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm doing these live streams every week. A lot of them will involve playing my Baroque cello because I know that's what people like the most. Um, so I am going to be playing. I played on the last two. You can check those out after the fact. Um, my other live streams are up on YouTube. Um, but I am accepting tips and donations for the live streams. 
So if you found this information valuable, you know, I did decide I could have charged for this and made it a webinar. I could have recorded a video and charged for it like my audio mixing tutorial, but I decided to do this live stream for free here on YouTube. Um, so I do hope that if you found it valuable and you have the resources and you're able to donate, it's super appreciated and it does show me, you know, how much people value what I'm doing. So you can do that on the GoFundMe, which is linked down there. Um, or if you don't want to deal with anything weird, you can be super simple and just use Venmo. GoFundMe does take some fees out on my end. So if you care that I get every single cent, Venmo is the way to go. Um, and I know a lot of people have already donated from the last two live streams I did. So thank you so much for those donations and support. Um, and I do still have my Patreon live. So if you want to support me in a more regular way, definitely check out my Patreon. That is linked in the description of the video as well. Um, so the Patreon is what's kept this YouTube channel alive. It's allowed me, because of the income that it brings in for me, it's allowed me to prioritize the channel and making videos and putting them out regularly. I can't say I would have the resources and the time to be able to build this channel if it weren't for the support of my patrons on Patreon. Um, so it's a huge part of what I do, um, but it, because it is a recurring payment, it's like a subscription, it's like paying for your Netflix every month, but you're playing, paying for your Emily Plays Cello, um, if you're not ready to like sign up for something recurring, then I just recommend the GoFundMe or Venmo if you want to do a little tip or donation. So thank you so much for everyone who's already donated, and if you do shortly, thank you guys so much. Um, all right, let's get to these questions. Um, What would be your approach to introduce less known classical early music that you would like to have the audience exposed to? So that's like my expertise is like unknown repertoire. And while certain things aren't great for it, like there aren't a lot of people searching for obscure repertoire, the people that are searching, they will find you because like some of the things that I recorded on my first two albums, Bass Sounds and Bass Sounds Evolved, um, almost no one had recorded those. So it's like if someone was looking for a recording of it, there was mine. Um, and I think the best thing about um, sharing obscure repertoire is it's a great teaching moment because most people will have not heard of the composer or heard of the piece. So you can share a little bit of information like about the composer, about the piece itself, and it's almost certainly going to be new information for everybody. So educationally, it's wonderful to do obscure repertoire. Um, so try to include as much information as you can. It doesn't have to be super heady technical information, just a little anecdote about the composer or about when they wrote the piece or, oh, you know, he wrote this after he studied with Haydn or, you know, there's lots of little things that you can throw in there and people will always find that stuff really interesting. Um, All right, uh, talk a little bit about OBS or other live streaming platforms. Yeah, so, you know, even though people see me as like a very technical, tech savvy person, and I'm somewhat tech savvy, uh, or I am tech savvy, but like I'm not nerdy about it. I actually don't enjoy like super technical stuff. Like I like what technology can do, but I don't like particularly enjoy like specs and like numbers and stuff. So like, I'm not, and I'm self-taught in all my technology stuff, you know, I didn't go to school for audio engineering or anything like that, so I don't know, like, a ton of super technical stuff, um, which I think is even more argument why anybody can do this, like, this live stream that I'm doing today, for example, I was going to use this external microphone that didn't work at the beginning of the stream, so that the audio quality would have been slightly better, like, just the sound of my voice would have been a little better um, through this, but because of the emergency situation, I'm using just the built-in microphone um, on my MacBook Air is what I'm streaming off of, um, and I'm using the built-in camera on my MacBook Air. It's a relatively new computer, 20... late 2016, maybe 2017, so it's a good quality camera and microphone, but it's just the built-in on the computer. So, um, I do my live streams just on my little MacBook Air, and then I use the OBS software, um, so for those who don't know if you want to stream to YouTube, basically all you need is a streaming software like OBS, which I believe was free, um, and then YouTube up in your account stuff will show you there's a certain thing called a streaming key and there's a couple things that you just have to copy and paste from your YouTube settings info, account info, um, into OBS so that OBS knows when you click 
start streaming, it streams to your YouTube channel. So that's the most technical part is getting like your streaming info from YouTube into the software that is going to do the live stream for you. And then OBS is really pretty simple. You're able to put all sorts of different things uh, and kind of set up how you want it to look. For me, I just set it up as a big capture of the webcam. So that here it is. And then I put this little bar down at the bottom that has my info. Um, and you can put all sorts of stuff. I'm going to see if I have some things for my old streams. Uh, um, I don't think so. That's something else. Yeah, so I have everything saved right here on OBS, like different um, little banners and little things you can put up. So you can customize that stuff, but it's all fairly self-explanatory. Like I said, I'm not going to go into like a lot of technical software things because um, you can always like look up a YouTube tutorial or ask someone who's used it before to walk you through. Um, but a lot of this stuff is not actually very complicated at all. Um, okay. All right, guys. So I think we are going to wrap up. We did about an hour and 15 on this stream. So um, I hope this was helpful. I know it was kind of just like an open discussion. I'm sure there are lots of topics we didn't even get into. Um, so if you're watching this archive later, please leave a comment if there's something you want to know more about or if I should do a live stream all about a certain topic. This was more just kind of about like everyone who's sort of at that point as a classical musician where they feel like, okay, I got to put myself out there, but like, I'm not sure yet. Or what about this? What about that? So these are just kind of like my philosophies, my approaches, things that have worked for me and what I've used up till now, um, just to give you guys some starting places. But if you're looking for more information on this, I have done live streams about social media for musicians before, um, both live streams and recorded videos. So I encourage you to dig into my YouTube channel. There's a lot of information there. Some of it will be some of the stuff I said today, but there's different information on everything. So definitely look under vlogs and live streams, um, the playlist of my YouTube channel to see me talk more on these topics if you're just like hungry for more information. Um, what else? I guess that's basically it. This was really fun. I enjoyed talking about this stuff. You know, I have been, of course, saying every classical musician should be putting their playing out there like this, but it's just, it took a pandemic. So now everyone's ready to do it. And I wanted to at least throw in some of my suggestions and what has worked for me. I'm really excited to see, you know, what other people bring to the table. I guess this is a good time also to mention um, I have been taking collaborator videos on my channel, um, you've probably seen them before, where I just feature somebody else's playing of Baroque or early music. And I'm doing that because, like I said, I haven't been putting out as much content on my channel, but I have this great platform of so many people interested in classical and Baroque music, so I would love to share that exposure with other musicians who are working so hard in this field. So if you are getting your YouTube channel or your Instagram started, um, and you're looking to build your following, definitely check out the form on my website to become a collaborator. It's really pretty simple and I can even help you get the video all set up and help you with the audio mixing or do it myself. So you can visit my website, emilyplacecello.com slash collaborators uh, to apply to be featured on my channel. It's definitely a really good way. Like I mentioned earlier, I got a lot of my Instagram following by getting a shout out on a big Instagram account. And I got a lot of my Facebook page followers because Classic FM started sharing my music on their enormous Facebook page with a million followers. Um, so that's where I got thousands of Facebook followers. So getting features on other big places that have the type of audience members, fans, followers that you want to have is a really great way to do it. So that's why I'm excited about being able to offer that to collaborators. So definitely check that out. Um, if you're looking for more like one-on-one -on -one support with your social media, like I said, I do consulting. That's also, you can sign up on my website for that. Um, everything's on my website that you could ever need. Um, not all my videos though, all my videos are only on YouTube. But in terms of getting in touch with me or getting some extra help or support in these areas, you can definitely do that on my website. Um, and yes, I did see that have some tips have come in on Venmo and on the GoFundMe. Thank you guys so much for the support. I really super do appreciate it. And I'm glad that what I'm providing for you feels like is of value because that is that is what I'm trying to do is help people and, uh, you know, give people some value there. So um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for your patience with the audio problem at the beginning. I'm going to have to put a thing 
about that, but that was a great example of how things can go wrong and you got to roll with it. That's live technology. Um, we didn't even talk about live streaming on like simpler platforms like Instagram, but that's pretty self-explanatory because it's all self-contained in the app. Uh, but yeah, so thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you learned a thing or two. Definitely leave me uh, any further questions or comments. And I will be back next week on Thursday with another live stream. Next week it'll be back to more actual cello playing again. Um, so I'm excited to do that and see you guys there. So thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you next time.